and welcome to Let's Care Live. Welcome to the conversation series. How's your day going so far? It's going good. Um, yeah, I had a, a long week just delegating to my team, getting things organized. I just got back from um, Peru. Um, so just kind of adjusting to the Rhode Island weather and just fully being centered and back to work and just trying to be the best delegator I can as the CEO um, of Mellon and virtual assistants. So, um, so yeah, it was one of those weeks. Yeah. Yeah. And you started out just sharing. So one, it's good to hear you're back from Peru. You're, you're settling in, you're doing well, but I want to just give you the chance to really like introduce yourself to anyone who's, who's tuned in. Yes, absolutely. Um, so like I was saying, I am the CEO of Melanin Aaron Virtual Assistance, um, where my team and I amplify brands by taking on task work, um, you know, time consuming admin work for like overwhelmed business owners who just want to get back to being um, an authentic person in their business, you know, showing up for webinars, showing up for lives, securing grants and money and really most importantly serving their clients and being the face um and so we also do podcast production um which is my specialty and that's really kind of the the flagship um i'm a podcaster of five years and uh we just you know take on that task work and we help people just um amplify their voice in the market you know and the, as well as their face um, so yeah, that's, that's what's been going on for the past seven months. It's been beautiful. I've been able to go on vacation and I have my team to depend on where I can just kind of, you know, touch base with them as to how things are going, you know, just kind of be like the manager, the project manager, make sure, making sure like graphics are coming back. And if anything's not working, jumping in there and being like, can I help? What's a better process for this? Um, so it's, it's been um, a learning experience, but I do have to say that mental health wise, it's better for me to work for myself versus a nine to five um, at this time. Yeah, I want to kind of start out there because so much of what I'm able to ask people about is just about like who they are and what their story is, their backstory, even beyond the work. So I'd love to like kind of hear from you you know, who are you even beyond the work? You mentioned a lot what you're doing with with your with um, Aaron Alexander, your virtual assistance business, your melanin virtual assistance business, which I'm sure we'll get to talking about that and the melanin piece, especially because I love that. Um, I will say first and foremost, as we start out that I, of course, like met you through Let's Care and just the work that I'm doing. And I was most amazed by your backstory and how you're making an impact in the world, even beyond the core of the work that you're doing. So could you just talk about more of your origin story, I guess? Of course. Um, <clears throat> so for me, um, I've been in the mental health field for seven years um, and I recently left to start my business, but um, in the meantime, while I was doing my podcast and I ended up doing radio, I ended up doing radio for Brown University, which is totally awesome. I uh, was also working at a psych hospital in Massachusetts. And um, in the beginning, I worked as a, uh, I worked the floor. So just keeping kind of the people there that have like different uh, diagnoses, maybe psychosis or bipolar. Um, there's an adolescent unit there at Fuller Hospital and um, just keeping them from, you know, there's a lot of fights. They're all locked in together. Their mm -hmm. meds are changing. They're tired of being in that same place. There's all this trauma and trauma bonding going on and relationships that shouldn't be happening. And, you know, so just trying to keep the drama at a minimum um, and keeping people safe, you know, which is where my delegation skills really were born. Um, because on a, on a unit like that, on an acute unit, delegation is imperative really for safety, not even just to be less of a headache. It's more like this person has a good relationship with the client and they're escalating. And so we all need to fall in line and, and go with strengths base and work as a team. Um, 
And so then I was promoted um, in admissions. And so I was reviewing evaluations. And then la er earlier last year, uh, COVID hit and it completely exacerbated my department. And I just felt like one, I don't have control over who I'm around in the middle of a pandemic. And I don't know what's going to happen to my job. And I saw a lot of job loss. I was an essential worker, but that could change throughout the year going into 2021 and so on and so forth. So after interviewing countless, um, you know, business owners over the years prior, I felt like if they can do it, and that was the message of my podcast, The Business of Soul Searching, if they can do it, I think I can do it. And honestly, um, me starting a business in 2020 wasn't the craziest thing that happened. I mean, you all saw the media, our president, you know, the pandemic itself and Black Lives Matter and riots and backlash and social media and Black Twitter was on fire. You know, and so it, it if it just felt like the right time to start my business. And the previous years, I had done a lot of soul searching. I had done a lot of mindset work because business um, is more mindset than anything. You know, like those are the people that that are carried through the marathon and make it to the end, quote unquote. It, it's mindset, you know, just being like, I am not going to give up. This is my dream. Whatever I have to do, if I have to invest in a team, if I have to invest in a coach, if I have to invest in a training, if I have to go broke, if I have to, you know, be embarrassed that something didn't work out in my brand, if I have to pivot, I will, because I see the long game. And, and for me, like I was saying, mental health, it, it was necessary. Um, and I know, Matt, I told you this, my father passed away uh, last year. And so that really confirmed, and I actually had put in my two weeks, a few weeks prior to that, before we yeah. got like his diagnosis and everything. And, you know, it was kidney cancer stage four. So it just progressed very quickly. Um, so it was a huge help to be able to work from home, not just to support my family, but, um, or be, be supportive to my family and to me, but going back to mental health, like, I don't, I don't know how people grieve and then go to their nine to five and their boss is picking at them for being a few minutes late when they've been up all night, whether it's crying or, you know, with depression and, and grieving your, your sleep schedules all over, you don't want to eat, you, you know, you're just, you're not yourself. Um, so honestly, I, I kind of almost feel like between my podcast and business, it, it saved me. You know, yeah. it allowed me the freedom, you know, now I'm traveling, but like even having the space to say, you know, I just need to meditate this morning before I jump into work. I just need to go for a drive. I just need to phone a friend. I just need, you know, to talk to my therapist. And, and luckily my clients were receptive to that. They're like, as long as things get done, and like there, there is some progress, like I'm, I'm more than happy, you know, to continue working. Um, and that was a blessing because I, at a nine to five, they're like, nah, I don't care. Your hair work, somebody got to do it and needs to get done today. So if it yeah. doesn't get done today, then we can find somebody else to do it. You know, yeah. so that was, that was my thing. That's so powerful. And, and like, again, something that I'm sure people who will be listening or watching will know is you know, I, like I, and I've talked with you about this, about my own grief experience, losing my dad. And, you know, it's powerful to, um, to, to just be able to, to bond with people in that shared experience. Cause it's not only our experience, there are a lot of people and especially looking at the year ahead, a lot of people just because of the pandemic and COVID are going to have their first grief anniversary. So looking at the mental health perspective, it is so important that people are able to hear these conversations and hear these perspectives um, from us. And maybe they're able to see that conversations around grief and loss and mental health are so um, important and they're okay. Part of my goal, other than talking about impact, is to normalize those conversations. Um, but I, I want to actually um, dive in more to what you were saying about mental health. You mentioned mental health a number of times, and it's so, I think it's such an interesting particular thing for someone to do work in the mental health field, because 
mental health practitioners of all varieties are people too. So you have to manage and carry your own uh, mental health and wellness and on top of just like supporting other people in a variety of ways. So I'm really curious, like what even initially drew you to, to study mental health and to the mental health field? Mm, yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, back when I was in college, um, many, many moons ago now, <laughs> um, it's not that far, but it feels like, feels like a lifetime once you get out of college, start your first job, and now I'm working for myself. So I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm 30, turning 31 this year. But um, so a motivator for me to enter the field, um, I know. I struggled a lot in college, um, just regulating myself, becoming independent, learning who I was, what is, you know, your identity. I feel like people turn 18, they go to college and there's so many things thrown at you. Like you're supposed to know what you want to do for the rest of your life. And you're supposed to know who you are and what are the right friends to be around and how to manage your time. And, you know, all of these things, never mind credit and all, you know, financing a car, if that's what people were doing at 18 and, and all of that. And, and I was uh, struggling significantly, you know, um, and I wasn't doing well. And I ended up flunking out of college um, just because I was focused on the wrong things. I was focused more on like the social aspect and, and that validation that that brings of, of, well, these people uh, are like my identity. Like I have to respond to their phone calls. I'm going to be late to class because I have to listen to this person's story. And um, just taking a step back and at that time going to, I believe my second therapist, second, yes. Um, I just realized that mental health is a, is very important. Going back to what you were saying, it's super important and we don't talk about it enough. Um, especially right. in the black community, we don't we don't talk about it. We sweep it under the rug. We say our our cousin or our aunt or whoever on what side is the crazy cousin, and we distance our, themselves from us. And then it's like they don't get the help, you know. And then they have children, and their children don't get the help because that's crazy Auntie Christine and their children, and and they're they're isolated, you know. Um, so that was that was really just like a, a coming of age type of thing. Um, I started taking psychology classes and I just fell in love with it. You know, um, I fell in love with the study of the brain, the study of a behavior of, of why people treat us like this. Why do we date the people that we do and why do we keep ending up in the same type of relationship and um, all of those things that that I didn't most people don't get in, in high school, you know, to prepare you for adulthood of, you know, there there's a an adjustment of going into college, you know, like some people may get overly anxious and all of these mental health issues come out just from the amount of stress, you know, of, of all of those things hitting you. So that's really what what helped me um, decide that I wanted to do mental health. And I ended up it just fit like a glove i don't know i just i did my internship and they loved me they kept me they kept me um and that i kind of just progressed from there and just kept getting accepted and promoted then i'd switch to another job get more pay and all of that um but that was i felt like there was a a huge um, kickback for me, just knowing I was helping people who struggled, like how I struggled, if not worse, you know, and I, I just, I love the field. It was hard to leave. I don't think that I could ever work another job other than for myself. If I was going to leave the mental health field, I couldn't work at a bank, couldn't work as a librarian. It's just yeah. not, I'm used to the fast pace. You don't know what you're going to get. Someone might lash out you know, um, you're going to hear a crazy story or like 2000 over seven years, you know? Um, so it's just, it, I don't know, it, it drew me in and like, right. The reason why I left other than wanting the freedom of working for myself is I felt like, um, there's only so much you can do as a mental health worker, um, under policy. And that's what I learned working at admissions is the insurance piece kind of controls who gets care, you know, similar to medical actually. Um, and, and I just felt like if I worked for myself, is there 
start an area where I could have even more impact or a different impact on a policy level if I'm starting a foundation or organization, you know, under my business for mental health because it's it's needed, you know. We see it all the time. Um, our president, for example, our recent president, I mean, mental health, like, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. and it's powerful. And I, I, I think that just because you mentioned our, our current, or you mentioned the president, I think of our current president that with Joe Biden here in the US mm -hmm. for those who might be international who might not know or, you know, but um, the thing that, that comes to mind with him is that I think you know, just uh, this past week, there was almost a, a ceremony of sorts to honor grief and to recognize grief as a reality. Actually, just outside of my window here in Washington, D.C., I could see the National Cathedral where um, the bells were, were tolling to recognize all of those lives lost due to COVID. And I think that that level of vulnerability that comes with talking about these topics is something that we don't always come by. It's something that's important to normalize. And I've already, I'm already seeing in comments uh, for those who are tuning in that um, they appreciate that vulnerability. And I know I do too, because we don't always have those, those conversations, but, you know, thinking about just your, your story and you mentioned um, turning to your virtual assistance business, as something that was um, sure, I mean, uh, I'm sure freeing for you in a lot of different ways, but from the mental health perspective, I know that wasn't the first time that you explored entrepreneurship. There was Master Your Glow, and you mentioned the podcast, Business of Soul Searching. So could you, could you talk a little bit about, like you were doing this work with mental health, but where did um, Master Your Glow and boss come into your journey and how like how did did your mental health work have anything to do with that yeah um i will definitely starting with boss so um in 2016 i had a mentor who is a life coach now she works for tuskegee for the social work uh, program but and that's her alumni um but i would go to her events and i was drawn in by how she valued wellness um, and that we don't take it as seriously as we should. And that, you know, you burning yourself out at a job that would replace you almost immediately, whether it's you lose your life or they, you're, they don't feel like paying you anymore at your price. And, um, and her just having those events and me going and networking and, and just being around other entrepreneurs I just felt like, how can I get into this industry like in a soft way? How can I test the waters? Yeah. And that was really where my podcast came from. And I also felt like I have a voice, you know, Trump was elected. So this is back, like people remember 2016, you know, I, yeah. I felt like I wanted a voice. I felt like going to school for mental health counseling because I was halfway through my master's at this time uh, working and I felt like I, being a mental health counselor is very restricting. So you're there as a service, you're, you're listening to the other person. You're not able to talk about all the, the insight that you have unless it's related to what the client is talking about. So you're not being friends with them, you know, even though you may want to and, and you guys are cut from the same cloth. And like, um, so I felt like, what if I started a program um, where I could speak my truth and I could be more relatable with other people and I could just get to know business deeper and I could kind of get these little, almost like in a um, investigating way, I could find out how did these people do it? How did they become successful? Like, I want to know what is the recipe? And so um, that's where Boss came from. And so I actually interviewed uh, my co-founder for Master Your Glow and uh, maybe I think it was my first season going into my second and wow. um we kind of separated at you know not separated but like we did the interview we started following each other on social media supported each other and um we came together in the beginning of 2019 and we said something that rhode island is missing in the black community um in providence is a wellness geared women's group 
where we can just be raw and talk to each other and relate and have well done events, not like, you know, I feel like the events were separate. It was either about business or it was party. There was nothing for people in the middle that were like in those 20, 25s, like, you know, photographers and like makeup artists and people to actually have a quality place to network and not just network, but to also get a taste of healing and learn from other people. So we started kind of executing these events um, where we would have social workers of 10 years come together and talk about wellness and healing and their story and, and validating that it's okay, you know, to be lost. It's okay. And the help is there for people, you know, of all races. And it's, it's scary, you know, for certain people, if they didn't grow up knowing about therapy, knowing about wellness and meditation, like this is all new. So to hear people that look like you, women that look like you, say these things that they actually go to therapy too. Um, for me, even it was life changing to be like, wow, like we really put these events together. Um, and so that's where Master Your Glow came from. Um, and yeah, it was all, I feel like everything I launch has to do with mental health, um, whether it's kind of in a smaller way behind the scenes or, you know, um, it's forefront. You know, even my business, my, my, you know, my ultra call, as people say it to people is like hiring help, hiring assistance is really about mental health. Like it's really about, I want to win, but I know I need someone to come in and help me and that's okay. You know, and it's more about my clients have, having better service. It's about me being able to sleep at night because I know before I hired my team in like November, December, I was up at who knows what time in the morning, working all the way through the day, barely getting lunch or working into the evening and then waking up and doing that on Saturday and Sunday. And like, if I'm going to start a business to free myself, that's not, that's not freedom. You know, I, I'm going from working four or five days a week to seven days a week. And we have like this understanding from, you know, the business owners before us, this hustle culture of you have to, to be successful, you have to be working 24 seven. And that's untrue. It is. There's people there that can help you in your price range that can help you sort things out. And a lot of times it's cheaper for you to have them do it because they do it quicker because they're the expert than you trying to sell, you know, uh, struggle and fumble through your website, trying to get your web website right, or trying to get your social media right, or you know, trying to figure out Zoom or something where you could just focus on your notes, your interview, or, you know, whatever it is that you do. Um, so those, I would say mental health is definitely the background of, of all my programs. Yeah, it's interesting to, to hear that because it's, that's an interesting framing, a powerful framing for um, just getting support and even for people like working with you, but also just in general for people who are accomplishing anything big, it's powerful to reach out and ask for help. And I think that sometimes we think of that as a sign of weakness when actually it's it's not only a, a sign of strength to admit when you don't have all the answers and the solutions and the skills needed and the time needed, but also it makes you stronger to get that support oftentimes. And, you know, I guess the one of the things that I think is so interesting looking at your journey is just knowing like where grief comes into your journey um, and you you came you come from this background in mental health, but I think that something I realize is that like regardless of how much you are aware of like mental health and a lot of the a lot of the the, the things that you need to do, it could, grief is is unpredictable and it's still challenging. Um, and I know about my I think of my own experiences with it. I was so thankful to like already know even before my dad passed away because he was he was sick for about a month and a half or so i i was i was really glad to know like okay i need to reach out to get help because this was bigger than me um and and something i couldn't handle alone and so for me 
you know, I, I found my way navigating that through um, like group grief, group grief therapy. Um, but I, I kind of want to hear from your perspective because I know you mentioned uh, wanting to talk about your your grief experience. Like what I, it, it like what what was that experience like for for you um, in just experiencing the loss of your dad while you're also building this this business and this thing that that you're putting out into the world definitely um and that is i i think before i start it's it's a yeah. a very point that you said that one you don't know when someone's gonna pass i mean no one knew the pandemic was coming no one knows when people are going to pass away and it, it doesn't even necessarily have to be someone passing away. It could be a serious relationship where you're grieving that person of five years, 10 years and up, you know? And for me, I'm glad that my background was in mental health and I had sought out therapy before and I definitely suggest it to people. You know, even if you're not grieving right now, even if you're not, going through something huge right now, it's awesome to start working with someone on skills, you know, on skills on how to cope and who you are and, and who you are in, in intimate relationships, dating or friendships at work, who, who you want to be like, be, it's not just grief work that you do with your therapist. Um, so it was good to have that background because it can be very anxiety provoking to go to a therapist and you, you know, I, it's like, um, you, you get so amped up and then the first session you just wanted to say everything and they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa okay, okay, I'm, I'm sorting everything out. I'm writing it down. I'm taking notes, but you don't, we'll have more sessions to keep, you know, revisiting this and working through this. Um, but it was a blessing that I already kind of had started this journey, um, you know, with mental health and knowing my capacity, knowing that I couldn't do this alone. Um, but it was difficult. It was difficult because my business needed me and I needed me and my family needed me. And it was a lot kind of trying to split myself into, you know, I guess, try not to spread myself too thin. And that was, I think, a huge thing for me was I set boundaries with myself. I set boundaries with my work because you might wake up and just want to not go to a bunch of work. And then the next day you might not want to get out of bed. You might not want to shower. You might not want to eat. Um, and those are all things that I definitely went through, you know, and, and just trying to find healthy ways to cope with it. I personally called my inner circle. Once I knew this was happening, I, uh, I called my inner circle, my closest cousins, just in case, like, you know, you, it, it just in case that I started acting weird or distant, I was like, I want you guys to know ahead of time, this is what's happening. Um, yeah. So letting people know, um, you know, it was, I don't know how to explain it. It was, it's it, you, you, your brain actually after a while kind of blocks it out. You know, when you think back of that time, you're like, how did I make it through? And mm -hmm. I have these tips because I was journaling you know, I had to journal it because my mind would always just be racing and, and it's like a million thoughts are coming in and you think of like, did I say everything I need to say to them? And, you know, there's a lot that goes into releasing the person into a, the spirit world. You know, you have your individual relationship with them, but um, just boundaries, self-care. Um, when I needed to stop, I would. I wouldn't push myself too far. If my body was saying I needed to rest today, I would rest. Um, you know, that those types of things, like, and, and my therapist is huge on identifying first what you need and then giving yourself what you need. But then if you like, but you have to have that self-awareness of what do I need in this moment? Why am I crying? Why am I frustrated? Is right. it that I need space? Do I need to be by myself for a moment? Do I need to journal? Do I need to eat? You know, when was the last time I ate? You know, is it just that, do I need to take a calming shower? Um, so just, you know, having this dream team of like my mentor, you know, patting myself with my friends who checked in with me, my family support, you know, having that support back and forth. And just, like I said, setting boundaries of like, if it's not gonna get done, it's not gonna get done. And I'm not gonna get down on myself because I'm going through a lot right now. Um, so yeah. I think those were 
the biggest things for me is just cutting out any toxicity, yeah. any drama. And it helps because you're like, I emotionally can't carry this extra stuff anyways. So I should have cut this out years ago, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's that's such an interesting point, though, around um, just in your experience, cutting out just some of the some of the toxicity and cutting out uh, some of those I'll say like negative influences or negative parts of your experience. And it's interesting because I relate that to my own grief experience, um, you know, just generally because you could only carry so much with you when it comes to uh, just all that you're, you're managing. I mean, to give an example of that, just from like speaking for myself, and it's been almost four almost exactly four years since my dad passed away. But like looking at the pandemic itself, that was such a point where I realized that because a lot of my mind and attention was on pandemic related things, like, you know, not yes. getting a virus or on, you know, just being, um, being with myself, like we all have really had to be in this time. It has mm -hmm. kind of taken away a little bit or distracted distracted um and i don't even mean that word in a um in a negative or positive way but just it's distracted from some of the focus on on grief which is to say we could only i feel like we could only often carry so much and that's one thing i've seen in a lot of the people that i've met on my own grief journey which is just that a lot of people will like cut just trim the fat is like a term that I don't love, but that describes it where it's like cutting out things in your life that might not be the most positive. But something I'm, I, I'm kind of fascinated by in your story and your experience is just the, the role of community. And I am kind of curious where, like, I mean, maybe this is going way back, but I'm curious how you discovered the power of community to just navigate the world around you, because you mentioned with Mass Your Glow, that's like, you know, founded by you. It's it's Black woman founded and it, it is mm -hmm. co-founded by you. And it's something that really relies on community um, through podcasting. You have also connected with people. So there's that community aspect there. And, you right. know, and so I, I'm seeing that theme even in, in your grief experience, but how did you first discover the power of community as you navigated um, just, well, I, I mean, in your, in your life, uh, d does it go back a long way or was that something that you discovered more recently? Um, I think, I mean, definitely, hmm, that's a good question. I'm trying to think it, there's kind of like, sparks throughout my life but i think so my first my first job in the mental health field was um at a rehab so um drug mm -hmm. and alcohol rehab and i would do group therapy and so that was intimidating of course because i'm like what do i say to these people and how do i relate and like they're gonna shoot me down and this is like public speaking and it was just hard i would shake like a leaf every time um, but the humility just took on. They just loved it. They were like, you're an authentic person. This is intimidating. You're new out of school and they're throwing you in. But, um, you know, what, what I've learned with recovery is it is about the um, community. You know, you, you can't do it all by yourself. You, there's going to be a time where you're just really triggered and you're reverting back to your old self and your old behaviors. And a quick phone call can help someone to just say, hey, come for a walk. Like, hey, like, I'll pick you up and let's go for a ride. And, and just understanding the power of these people who have been sober, even though they relapsed, which is why they were coming to see me, they yeah. relapsed after 10 years or something like that. What kept them sober was going to meetings and being around, you know, people that understood them. And that's what I realized going to school um, for mental health. And that's what I was missing was just, and a lot of us are missing is we just want to be understood as humans. We just want someone, even just one person to understand where we're coming from, why we are the way that we are, and that we can just they can identify with us, you know? And I think I think entering into the podcast world and, and going, you know, to my mentor at, 
at the time, um, her events in realizing that a lot of them knew each other um, already from going to the same events and that they were just stronger together. And you just get so much farther and it feels so much better working as a team and working with other people, having someone to, to bounce ideas off of, having someone, you know, in, and in fact, my partner for Master Your Glow, like when things were happening with my dad, that's who I was calling, you know, or she would call and be like, is everything okay? And I've been seen you online, you know, that's huge when you're grieving because you get lost. You don't even realize that you're not doing what you used to do. You're just sucked into just getting through the day, you know? And like, I, that was, that itself was huge for me. Um, but yeah, I think the theme has just been running and, and I love it. I love working with other people. I love just, I, I love the support and I love supporting other people. And like, like I said, having having a team around you is just, it feels better. You feel supported. You have someone to laugh with. You have someone to cry with. And that was the power of Master Your Glow is that we were really authentically involved yeah. in mental health. We both had our mental health passed. You know, her her mom passed before wow. um, we started Master Your Glow. So it was just really ironic that my dad ended up passing because she already knew how to, she was like, well, there's this and make sure that you're processing things. Don't skip any parts of grief because it's gonna come back and it manifests in your body. And she would just, you know, I would just cry sometimes. And sometimes we would do work. Sometimes it'd just be sister time. But I mean, I've never regretted having a, this circle around me because some people isolate themselves and they want to do it on their own. And, you know, I, I did it on my own. I'm successful only because of me. I don't want that. I'm good. I'll, I'll go with other people helping me. There, there's no way I could do this on my own, you know, not even just business, but just being able to be a healthy ver version of myself. I, I do need other people to come in and sometimes, you know, check check you, you know, you might need someone to say, Hey, you're kind of, is this really aligning with your goals? Is this what you said you wanted to do? Yeah. You know? Um, so that's, I would say somewhere between podcasting, it ramped it up, working in the mental health field that kind of ramped it up, master your glow. And it kind of just filtered into my business. So by now I'm like, I'm used to working as a team. I'm like, you're good at that. Cool. That's what you're going to do. You're good at that. You let, this is what you like to do. And I don't like to do this task. You got it. All you. <laughs> yeah, I think, and this is, it's powerful to hear. And something that I wonder about um, it, it, that I could sum up in one word is just melanin in all of this, because something that I admire about you is that like melanin is literally like it's within your name and your brand and what you're doing. And it's central to yes. it. It's it, well, I was gonna say it's central to who you are. It's central to who I am too. But um, it's yes. also something that is like something that you very intentionally like integrated into your life and your work and how you are engaging with the world. And I just want to ask, like, um, from your perspective, why was that so important, and why did you make that decision to really like lean into the melanin aspect of your work, not just with virtual assistance, but um, beyond? Yeah, um, that's an awesome question. I'm like, these are the questions that I like being asked. Um, <laughs> I love this interview, so I knew I would love this interview, but still. Um, so for me, as a black woman growing up in the suburbs, that's predominantly white, um, I felt like my whole life going back to identity, right? So like we grow up in these spaces where we don't really see ourselves other than like our home and then when we visit our cousins and all of that. And so there's so much identity formation that has to take place for you to be confident in your skin color, to be confident in your heritage to yeah. be confident in your history that's been manipulated and turned around and I guess whitewashed, you could say. Right. Um, and so for me, um, I felt like right now, not just right now, but even from when I started my podcast, I need to be around other people of color. I'm fine with being around people of different races, my friends, I have all different types of 
friends from different backgrounds and different areas that, you know, don't necessarily look like me. But right. for me, I need to supplement myself with other people that understand my struggle, that understand what it feels like when someone says the N word, that understands what, how, you know, we felt as a collective for the past four years and, and how policy and politics impact us. Um, we have a different story and that's definitely, um, you know, the biggest part of Master Your Glow in, in any of my brands is that no one tells our story better than us. And I'm right. tired of other people telling our story and that's why it's important for us to get on podcasts that's why it's important for us to get on radio stations and to take our brands and organizations seriously whether it's investing in pr or or what it, wherever your weak area is in your brand to invest so that you can really get on that level where you have you know an even bigger impact and so um, for me, at least for Melon and Erin virtual assistants, I feel like Erin is such a, a common name, you know, for maybe like a white woman, but not, I wanted people to know whose brand this was. Right. And um, at first, you know, when I ran it by a few people in the beginning, right before I launched, they were like, mm, melanin is it too geared to people of color? And I was just like, well, you know, and, and those are the people predominantly that I work with. Those are the people that pay me. I'm not changing it. People love it. You know, it's like Melon and Erin. Like people love it. They, they're like, I love your logo. And I love that it's Melon and Erin. It just makes me feel like I'm doing the right thing, you know, and investing in myself. I feel safer with you. I feel like you're confident in your brown skin. You're confident in, in us, in, in our power. And, um, and yeah, I, I just, I don't want to feel like I'm hiding. I want to be proud, um, as we should be, you know, about being melanated. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think the other piece, just to react to the name with my own takes on that, my own thoughts on that is that I love the name because, and I, I mean, I think that there are multiple ways you could kind of go about showing who you are and what you represent. But like the last thing I'm sure that you would want or even that I would want is to like attract someone who is not okay with my melanin or who's not okay with my identity in some way. So that's one reason that I'm so passionate even just about like putting, I mean, well, it's funny cause it's not really a choice, you know, to, to show up in the world and be like, this is my melanin, but to like lean into it and, and to talk about the importance of um, identity, to talk about the importance of like diversity and inclusion, equity and justice, but also to talk about blackness. Like if that makes you uncomfortable, then it, we probably wouldn't have a great working relationship as it is. And so I love that you lean into that because it also helps attract the people who are um, not even the people who are like you, but the people who you do want to surround yourself with, like, you know, and, and so I really appreciate that about you, you focusing on that. But I wanted to ask kind of like the flip side of the question, which is like, do you feel like there are elements of you and what you bring to the table, um, not just like skill wise, but identity wise that people overlook because you because they might see like, okay, this is Erin, she's a black woman, this is the focus on them. Are there elements of your identity? And you know, that's a broad word, but I like it because it's a broad word, like that mm -hmm. you wish more people would see um, that they don't, they might not see on the surface. Um, and if I'm hearing you correctly, it sounds like, um, you know, are there situations where people might see melanin and might feel maybe excluded or might not take the time to go through kind of my resume and my portfolio just because they're like, am I a good fit for her? Is she speaking to me? Um, and I mean, honestly, I, I guess my best response to that would be I'm working with my dream clients. So like mm -hmm. if someone feels like the word melanin or maybe even looking at my profile and it's intimidating to them and you know whatever that's okay because they're not my dream client they're not we weren't meant to be similar to dating you know and yeah. i just feel like 
I'm, I'm happy that they don't feel comfortable and I hope that they go find someone that they're more comfortable with because yeah. going back to what you were saying, I, I don't, I didn't leave my nine to five job where there's a lot of, I, I, I couldn't wear this. I couldn't wear this head wrap. Mm -hmm. I couldn't wear this. I couldn't be, you can't be yourself at a nine to five for me. You know, whether it's the locks, some people have to cut their locks out or cut their natural hair or they have to straighten yeah. it. And, and I feel like the power of having your own brand is you can authentically show up as you. So the people that do invest in me have looked through everything and or looked as far as they were like, oh, podcast producer. Cool. She can take that off my plate or, <laughs> you know, whatever it is that they're willing to get rid of, you know, scan through certain things. Um, I feel personally like when you show up as your authentic self, you attract the people that you belong with in your life. And that's my favorite thing is I don't have to hide anything. If I want to go on vacation, my clients are like, enjoy yourself, send me yeah. pictures so I can feel like I'm on vacation with you. <laughs> like, whereas at a nine to five, it was like, okay, I have this certain amount of PTO. And like, if I come back late and what am I going to say? And it's none of that now, you know, they trust me. And um, I don't feel like I'm closed off to people who are not, you know, um, black, for example. But, you know, I, I just, I don't know, I'm open to who will have me, but I'm not going to, to force myself to, to feel worthy of your validation. If it, you know, I'm not going to be in, in a business relationship like that. That's just not me. Um, I would rather be like, Hey, this just really probably isn't going to work out. And I do have people that I can refer them to that might be a better fit. Um, because there's yeah. really no pain, like trying to fit yourself in a box in, in trying to force yourself to be someone that you're really not. Um, and so that's, that's, I guess my, my response on that. No, that's a powerful, that's a powerful lesson. And I think just as we get closer to the end of this conversation, it is, it's, it's a power. It's really great to hear from you with just a number of the elements of your journey, because I think that there's a lot around, well, clearly mental health informs like all of your perspective and all of the work that you're doing in different ways, but it's very interesting to see how it manifests because so much of what I'm seeing is this, oh, so much of what I'm seeing is this self-love and self-acceptance um, and something that I think that a lot of people could could relate to. Um, and so Erin dropped off for a second. We'll see if we could get her back, but uh, just to talk to the folks that are, are here live watching, you know, for me in my own journey, I have felt like it has been really important to lean into who I am, to lean into just the different things that I bring to the table because at the end of the day, it is so difficult to, at times, um, it's so fulfilling, but it's also so difficult at times to be a, um, you know, to be a young person or to be someone of, just to be the only one of you in the room, which I know that oftentimes we experience um, in in so many different ways. And so um, as we wait for Aaron to come back, one thing I would just mention is that soon I will be sharing a film that really celebrates and focuses on identity. Um, and it is called 20s and Change San Francisco. Um, and I'll be putting it out into the world more soon, but it's something that I filmed in June 2019, along with my friend Eric Dowds. And Eric is a filmmaker and he is a member of the type one diabetes community. And in thinking about the conversation with, with Erin, and maybe this is why I thought it'd be so great to interview her. There are so many different intersections with mental health in our film because I do talk about my grief experience um, with identity in our film because everyone that we talk with has some kind of relation to this idea of identity and we, we talk about it. Um, I really believe that the world needs more of those conversations on identity and so I'm so glad that I've been able to have that with Erin um, and very 
very soon I'm going to welcome Aaron back into the conversation. Um, Aaron, thank you for coming back. I, we had there was just so much, so much depth there that the the Wi-Fi could not handle all that we were. <laughs> that we were but it was a good chance for me to talk a little bit about identity and talk about 20s and Change San Francisco, the film. Um, I'm just like thankful that we could have this conversation about these deep topics and that the Wi-Fi has held up for most of this conversation. Thanks for everyone who's watching and still yeah. tuned in. Um, but I want to see Aaron just if there's, you know, before getting to one of my last questions, I just want to see if there's anything that I haven't asked about that you want to address or mention? This is a very broad question. <laughs> well, no, it's not even that it's broad. I felt like you are, uh, and I've been interviewed from obviously doing podcasting and being in that, that network. I feel like you're one of the best interviewers I've sat with. And I'm not just saying that, you know, I, I really Thank believe you. that the questions that you asked are so in depth and thought provoking. Um, I, I feel like I'm going back, like I'm gonna go back through this interview, like these are questions I wouldn't wanna ask. Like I'm gonna write and send these to other people, like make sure you ask these questions because this is what gets to the heart of the person. Um, yeah. Yeah, I can't it, think of anything. I yeah, felt like yeah. we really went through my story with, with a fine tooth yeah. comb and I'm very, I'm, thank you, you know. No, thank you. And it's it's powerful and it's a conversation, right? So I'm going to go back and um, real like look back at what questions I asked, because really it's just like talking with you about your experience and diving in more, which is an honor and a privilege. And also to the point of some of the things that you were saying, it's so great to be able to find community in other people in conversation and to see the things that bring us together and that relate us and and all of that. But I do have one more question for you. I'm hoping that the internet connection will hold up for this question. I am, I'm, I'm putting all my energy into it. But I want to ask you my, my final question. My final question, Erin, if your life were a book or a documentary, what would the title of it be and why? Um, hmm, that's a good one. I would have to say, and I've thought of starting a, a podcast with this theme. Um, I would say, Where in the World is Erin? Um, because one, I like to travel, of course. Everybody, anybody that's ever followed me, um, through my journey, and it really has been over the past five, six years. Some people have been following me since I even before I started the podcast, you know, and um, and they're cheering, of course, but. Yes. Um, also, I feel like I, I constantly reinvent myself. I feel like I'm open to all of the possibilities. I do not limit myself. And whether that's in another country or if it's a different brand or business, I feel like I'm open to pivoting because I that's success to me, is living a lifestyle that your higher power and your ancestors would want you to live. And just cutting out all of that extraneous opinions of that's a scary move or that's a said just cutting all of that out and focusing on what you really need out of this world and what your purpose is um i feel like where in the world is erin is yeah it's actually a good idea i should write that down too <laughs> yeah well, i just that might no, be my next book who knows i just wrote it that down where in the world it, it needs to be maybe but i want to ask like a follow-up to that um for that book um, if you were to have anyone write the foreword of the book, who would you ask to write the foreword? I know you mentioned your your co-founder of Master Your Glow, but is there is there anyone else that you think would be like maybe maybe it's her, maybe it's someone else? Who would write the foreword of that book? Um, I would have to say uh, my best friend, and I have a few, but. Um, my best friend, Tori, I feel like she's able to encapsulate my journey from college to now and to mm. be able to really, because it's, it's um, a lot of times it's funny and her and I talk about, you know, people look at us now that like we have money, we have a car, we have this, we're doing things for ourselves, we graduated college, but like 
they don't remember what we they or they weren't around when we didn't have money in college and we were paying you know um what do you call it like going through change purse just for gas or certain things uh -huh. like you know i feel like her being able to see this journey and and we talk about it all the time like i said i feel like she'd do a, a really really dope forward i think that would be she would be like the best she, she she knows all the stories. She was physically there with me riding this entire time, you know? So I think she would be a great uh, resource for that. And um, any other questions? I feel like, okay, we got our, my book written. Like we're about to yeah. write out my whole book here. Yeah, I was gonna say that it, it's so powerful. I mean, the only question I have really, I think this is the only one, but I, I know myself to always find another question to ask. So. I'll, uh, I think my last question is, where can people connect with you? Where can people learn more and follow your journey? Um, and then, you know what, also, like if you have any, just anything else you want to plug or mention um, or recommend, feel free to do that. The floor is yours, Erin. Definitely. Um, so I actually just came out with um, a new training, The Art of Delegation. And um, that training that I did for the first time at a retreat, I just went to um, three weeks ago. So that training is really about uh, what I realized from um, working at the psych ward that I mentioned earlier, and uh, the power of delegation, the power of knowing who you are, what you're good at, and being able to look in at your surroundings and to know who else you can call on. Um, and that also translates to business. So I felt when I started this virtual assistant journey, this disconnect, I felt like a lot of business owners know they're creatives. You know, they're creatives. They came up with a business out of nothing. They came up with an organization out of, out of nothing. They just dreamt it up in their head and executed. And like, but it's hard for them to then give the task work to someone else and um, to be able to write it down and to just get it out of their head. And it's scary hiring help. You know, you're, you're literally handing your baby over, you know, to someone. So I came up with the art of delegation training that's up on my, um, that's up on my website, www.melaninarinvirtualassistance.com. And, um, and yeah, I have, you know, Instagram and Facebook, Melanin Aaron VA, and you're more than welcome to, you know, go to my website, check out the training and just to kind of just get in the vibe, join the email list and, um, stay connected because there are more things coming that I, I, you know, my team is working on it. I love that I have a team now behind me to amplify businesses um, and to amplify my business too, because they do my graphics, my social, my website and everything else. So um, we have some really, really awesome passion projects that I wanted to release last year, but things kind of, I felt like the audience and the world was just in so much turmoil. I just felt like dropping it last year wouldn't be the best time. Um, so stay tuned. I have some awesome stuff for you guys and please follow me and visit my website. Awesome. Thank you so much, Erin. And you know, if there's anything I could say, just uh, reacting to all that you shared and even just uh, everything that you've shared throughout this interview, it's that oftentimes one of my frustrations is that people might think of change maker in a very specific box of what that looks like, what that is. And I don't even mean from like the identity and melanin perspective, even though that is one element of what people might not see when they think of change makers, but even more like they don't think they don't necessarily think of someone who is doing the work that you're doing when it comes to being virtual assistant, when it comes to podcasting and producing podcasts and everything else you mm -hmm. do trainings and all of the above um, as being a change maker. But I'm, I'm really thankful that we have the chance to kind of dive in and share your perspective as a change maker and show that a change maker isn't just one thing. It could be many things. And so you've really shared that with me. And I am very thankful for that. I'm thankful for your mental health focus. I'm thankful for um, just you as a human. And I'm glad that we were able to to share more of your your story but i will say um well as much as i just said how thankful i am um thank you first and foremost 
Um, and, and also, as I said at the end of each and every one of my interviews, I want you to, um, especially just thinking of mental health and grief and all of the challenges that pop up in the world, um, I can't encourage you enough to keep impacting. So thanks again, Erin.